sound I want to produce. For example, this sound. Can you hear anything? Exactly, because I'm not even touching it. <laughs> but yet, we get the sensation of something happening. In the same way that when I see tree move, then I imagine that tree making a rustling sound. Do you see what I mean? So whatever the eye sees, then there's always sound happening. So there's always, always that huge, I mean, just this kaleidoscope of things to draw from. So all of my performances are based on entirely what I experience, and not by learning a piece of music, putting on someone else's interpretation of it, buying all the CDs possible of that particular piece of music, and so on and so forth. Because that isn't giving me enough of something that is so raw and so basic and something that, that I can fully experience the journey of. So it may be that in certain halls, this dynamic may well work. other halls they're simply not going to experience that at all and so therefore my level of soft gentle playing may have to be So because of this explosion in access to sound, especially through the deaf community, this has not only affected how music institutions, how schools for the deaf treat sound, and not just as a means of therapy, although of course being a participator of music, that definitely is the case as well, but it's meant that Acousticians have had to really think about the types of halls they put together. There are so few halls in this world that actually are have, have very good acoustics, dare I say. By, by that I mean where you can absolutely do anything you imagine. The, the tiniest, softest, softest sound to something that is so broad, so huge, so incredible. There's always something. It may sound good up there, may not be so good there, may be great there, but terrible up there, may be terrible over there, but not too bad there, etc, etc. So to find an actual hall is incredible for which you can play exactly what you imagine without it being cosmetically enhanced. And so therefore, acousticians are actually in conversation with people who are hearing impaired and who are participators of sound. And this is, this is quite interesting. I, I cannot you know, give you um, any detail as far as, well, what is actually happening with those halls. But it's just the fact that they are going to a group of people for whom so many years, for which so many years we've been saying, well, how on earth can they, can they experience music? You know, they're deaf. They're, they, we, just, we go like that and we imagine that's what deafness is about. Or we go like that and we imagine that's what blindness is about. If we see someone in a wheelchair, we assume they cannot walk. It may be they can walk three, four, five steps. That to them means they can walk. In a year's time, it could be two extra steps. In another year's time, three extra steps. Those are hugely important aspects to think about. So when we do listen to each other, it's unbelievably important for us to, to really 
to really test our listening skills, to really use our bodies as a resonating chamber, to stop the judgment. For me, as a musician who deals with 99% of new music, it's very easy for me to say, oh yes, I like that piece, oh no, I don't like that piece, and so on. And, you know, I just find that I have to give those pieces of music real time. It may be that the chemistry isn't quite right between myself and that particular piece of music, but that doesn't mean to say I have the right to say it's a bad piece of music. And, you know, it, it's just, it's one of the great things about being a musician is that it is so unbelievably fluid. So there are no rules, no right, no wrong, this way, that way. If I asked you to clap, maybe I can do this. If I can just say, please, clap and create the sound of thunder. I'm assuming we've all experienced thunder. Now, I don't mean just the sound, I mean really listen to that thunder within yourselves. And please try to create that through your clapping. Try. Just please try. Snow. Snow. Have you ever heard snow? No. Well then, stop clapping. <laughs> Try again. Try again. Snow. One finger, guys. See, you're awake. Rain. Two fingers. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad. You know, the, the interesting thing here, though, is that I asked a group of kids not so long ago exactly the same question. Now, great imagination. Thank you very much. However, not one of you got out of your seats to think, right, how can I clap? Okay, maybe... Maybe I can use my jewellery to create extra sounds. Maybe I can use the other parts of my body to create extra sounds. Not a single one of you thought about clapping in a slightly different way other than sitting in your seats there and using two hands. In the same way that when we listen to music, we assume that it's all being fed through here. This is how we experience music. Of course, it's not. We experience thunder, 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 think, think, think. Listen, listen, listen. Now, what can we do with thunder? I remember my teacher, um, when, when I first started my very first lesson, I was all prepared with sticks, ready to go. And instead of him saying, okay, Evelyn, please, you know, feet slightly apart, arms at a more or less 90 degree angle, sticks in a more or less V shape, Keep, keep this amount of space here, etc. Please keep, keep your back straight, etc., etc., etc. Where I was just probably going to end up absolutely rigid, frozen, and I would not be able to strike the drum because I was thinking of so many other things. He said, Evelyn, take this drum away for, for seven days and I'll see you next week. So, heavens, what was I to do? I, I, I no longer required the sticks. I, I wasn't allowed to have these sticks. I had to basically look at this particular drum, see how it was made, what these little lugs did, what the snares did, turned it upside down, experimented with the shell, experimented with the head, experimented with my body, experimented with jewellery, experimented with all sorts of things. And of course I returned with all sorts of bruises and things like that. But nevertheless, you know, it was such an unbelievable experience because then where on earth are you going to experience that in a piece of music? Where on earth are you going to experience that in a study book? So we never ever dealt with actual study books. So for example, one of the things that we learn when we are dealing with um, uh, being a, a percussion player as opposed to a musician is basically straightforward single stroke rolls. Like that. And then we get a little faster. And a little faster. And a little faster. And so on and so forth. What does this piece require? Single stroke rolls. 
So why can't I then do that whilst learning a piece of music? And that's exactly what he did. And interestingly, the older I became, and when I became a full-time student at a so-called music institution, all of that went out of the window. We had to study from study books. And constantly, the question, well, why? Why? What is this relating to? I need to play a piece of music. Oh, well, this will help your control. Well, how? Why do I need to learn that? I, I need to relate it to a piece of music. You know, I need to say something. Why am I practicing paradiddles? Is it just literally for control, for hand stick control? Why am I doing that? I need to have the reason. And the reason has to be by saying something through the music. And by saying something through music, which basically is sound, we then can reach all sorts of things to all sorts of people, but I don't want to take responsibility of your emotional baggage. That's up to you when you walk through a hole, because that then determines what and how we listen to certain things. I may feel sorrowful or happy or exhilarated or angry when I play certain pieces of music, but I'm not necessarily wanting you to feel exactly the same thing. So please, the next time you, you go to a concert, just allow your body to open up, to allow your body to be this resonating chamber. Be aware that you're not going to experience the same thing as the performer is. The performer is in the worst possible position for the actual sound because they're hearing the contact of the stick on the on the drum or the mallet on the bit of wood or the bow on the string, etc., or the breath that's, that's creating the sound from wind and brass. They're experiencing that rawness there, but yet they're experiencing something so unbelievably pure, which is before the sound is actually happening. Please take note of the life of the sound after the actual initial strike or breath is being pulled just experience the whole journey of that sound in the same way that I wished I'd experienced the whole journey of this particular conference rather than just arriving last night. Um, but I hope maybe we can share one or two things as the day progresses. But um, thank you very much for having me.